So last week, we started to look at this series um, of teaching on faith, and we looked at the subject of living by faith. And we established that faith is the currency by which we operate in God's kingdom. In the same way that a nation cannot do without its currency, so it is in God's kingdom. We cannot do without the currency of faith for every transaction that holds in God's kingdom is by faith. And we looked at the sort of things that faith can achieve for us in God's kingdom. We say faith is how we receive everything that God has already provided for us through Jesus Christ. Faith is the currency that we give in exchange to receive anything and everything that Jesus has already won for us. Faith is how we live beyond our means. We said in God's kingdom, the vision that God gives us will always be bigger than our means could ever cater for. But faith is how we are able to live beyond our means. Faith is how we live 10 lives in one life. Okay, So faith is how you live beyond your years, as it were, literally combining 10 lives into one life. Faith is how we take kingdoms and territories for God. So today, I want to build on that and round up the series um, by looking at the laws of faith. The laws of faith. Now, for many years, I used to wonder why some nations of the world are not as productive as other nations. In fact, it became more confusing to me when I realized that many of the unproductive nations are nations where prayers are regularly offered to God. Recently, the Pew Research Center, a nonpartisan think tank based in Washington, D.C., released an interesting list of the most prayerful countries on earth. Now, I need to contextualize this research. So the question was about how many people pray on a daily basis. So that was the question. So it wasn't necessarily a measure of how religious the country was. Because, for example, a country like China is a religious country. Buddhism is quite strong and other forms of easing in the country. But their religion does not require them to pray daily. So this research was about countries that pray daily, okay? And the top 10 in order are Afghanistan, Nigeria, Algeria, Senegal, Djibouti, Iran, Iraq, Niger, Indonesia, and Paraguay. Now, you, hopefully you can see a link in all of those. Now, the least prayerful nations in the world in rank order are China, United Kingdom, Switzerland, Austria, Czechia, Germany, Estonia, France, Denmark, and Sweden. Hopefully, again, you can see another link there. So I used to ask myself, shall we say then that God is not answering the prayers raised to him? Or is he, does he not have the capacity to answer prayers? Now I believe I know the answer to this question. And I would like to share it with you this morning. Okay? And the answer is this. God completed the creation of the universe in six days. And since then, he has been maintaining the universe by laws. From the moment he completed the creation of the universe, up from then up until now, until the end of time, he's been maintaining the universe by laws. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to read that verse in the New Living Translation and the Amplified. He said, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains, now this is the bit I want you to take note of. He sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Amplified version, please, if you can give that to me in amplified version. He said, the sun is the radiance and only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being, the brilliant light of the divine, and the exact representation 
and perfect imprint of his father's essence, and upholding and maintaining and propelling all things, the entire physical and spiritual universe by his powerful word, carrying the universe. God created the world and he put laws in place to maintain it. You know, from the time God created that, even human beings, God does not need to create them anymore. He put a system and a law in place by which we can procreate and bring other human beings into being. God does not have to wake up every morning and say, I'm going to set my alarm for 6 o'clock because I have to tell the sun to rise at 6 a.m. He set that system in place that the sun would rise every day and set every single day, marking day and night. So he put the laws in place. Everything we have been doing since then is discovering and applying the laws. You see, there's nothing we have discovered that was not already there at the time that God created Adam and Eve. We are the ones discovering those things as we move on. So as an example, God does not say, mm, today is Sunday the 19th of November. What weather shall I give them in the United Kingdom? No, he doesn't say that. He sets the law of seasons in place to guide the weather and the seasons. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world that is governed by laws. Some of those laws are physical, others are spiritual. What is a law by definition? A law is simply a principle that has a predictable consequence of an action. A principle that has a predictable consequence of an action. So a law is a principle that when you take certain actions, you can predict what the consequence of those actions would be. Regardless of the nature of the law, whether natural or spiritual, laws do one thing. They work with mathematical precision. You can sleep on them because you know they are going to work with mathematical precision. And this is why it's possible to forecast the weather because of the laws that governs the season. And we can forecast it in some places with mathematical precision. This is why it's possible for meteorologists to predict exact timings of eclipse. I have witnessed one or more eclipse in my lifetime. And they will tell you, at about this time, 12.03, it will happen to the minute. They will predict it because of laws. It allows us to be able to predict things because we know it's going to work with mathematical precision. So when we say that God is omnipotent, some believers believe that it means God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. However, unfortunately, that's us pro pro projecting our faulty perception of, on God, perceptions that we get from human rulers, all-powerful human rulers, emperor. That's not how God works. Although God has the power to do and undo, in principle, God does not work that way. God limits himself to working within the laws that he puts in place. He put laws in place to guide how we obtain results in every facet of life. And this is the key thing. God himself will not break those laws unless by the activation of a higher law. If you don't get anything today, get that. God put laws in place to govern how we get results in every facet of life. And God himself will not break that law unless by the activation of a higher law. So in many of these nations, their prayer is about trying to get God to break the laws that he has put in place. And that's why they don't get answers. Because God himself will not break the laws that he has put in place unless by the activation of a higher law. Psalm 138 verse 2. This is what God says. Again, we are looking at how God has established laws in nature. He said, I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. You have magnified your word above all your name. 
God's word, which is principles or laws, is the most exalted entity both in heaven and on earth. God has exalted his word even above his name, as it were. So God contains himself within the laws that he has put in place. And he does not really nearly break those laws. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Even prayer has a parameter within which it works. He says, if we ask according to his will. So prayers is not even guaranteed to answer. They are to be answered. There are laws that govern prayers that decide whether prayers are answered or not. James chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. This is the law of faith and work. James 2, 14 to 17. He said, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? <coughs> does also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That's the law of faith and works that we see there. Now, so this is why some nations have been praying to God for years. Yet nothing has happened because all they do is pray whilst they fail to con they continue to fail to activate the laws that will make their nation productive. You know, laws such as laws of systems and structures, the laws of transparency, the laws of equity and justice, the laws of service, the laws of teamwork, etc., etc. I discuss some of these laws. Um, in, uh, uh, that bring about national development in my book titled Value Shift, Learning from the Best of Two Worlds. You can read that in your own time. But I'm just going to move on a little bit now. I recall once listening to a message by Bishop David Oyedepo, and in that message he was talking about the keys to prosperity. In the introductory part of that message, he said something to the effect that, like, if you want to open a door, you will go and find the key to open that door. Simple. There's no other way to open the door. You just find the key and you open it. He said you can scream at the door. You can kick at the door. You can do anything else but use the key. The door will not open to you. It would only answer to the right key. And he then said that this is what some Christians are inadvertently doing. When all they do is to pray for God for prosperity. Pray to God for prosperity. He said, God has given us the keys to prosperity, but they are contained in his word, and prosperity does not answer to prayer. And I remember listening to that message and feeling offended in my spirit. How can you talk about prayer like that? Prayer is, is very powerful. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that, calm down and listen to what he has to say. That was my religious self, in the same way that some of you may be getting offended now. Now, what is Dr. Henry saying? How's my religious self speaking there? You know, can I be more religious than Bishop, <laughs> as it were? But he knew what he was saying. And thank God I listened because I learned something from it. You see, what Bishop Yedeko is talking about is the same thing I'm talking about to you today. He called them keys. I call them laws. They are one and the same thing. And the Bible is full of laws that are intended for our own benefit when we activate them. For example, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, alone, this was after the flood and all of that, God put certain laws in place. About four laws already are contained here. There's the law of day and night. He said, whilst the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So as surely as there is a day, there will be a night. And that's why God does not have to wake up every morning to set things in motion. He's already put that law there. There's the law of seed and harvest. That as you plant seeds, in time they will bear fruit and there will be a harvest. There's the law of seasons. There's the law of cold and heat from which we derive the second law of thermodynamics. These are laws that God has put in place. And those laws govern how our world is run today. 
I'm going to tell you five things very quickly about laws before I go to talking about the laws of faith. Number one thing about a law is this. A law would work for anyone who activates it. A law would work for anyone who activates it. This explains why sometimes even unbelievers are getting results in certain areas that believers are ignorant of. Because a law would work for anyone who activates it. There are natural laws and there are spiritual law. Anyone who activates those laws will get the result. You see, a law does not distinguish between the rich and poor. It doesn't distinguish between the old and young, black or white, male or female. It will simply work for anyone who activates it. There's nothing discriminatory about a law. It works for anyone who activates it. The second thing about a law is that a law does not care whether it was activated accidentally or deliberately. It would still work provided it is activated. You know, sometimes we accidentally activate some laws. It doesn't matter whether it was deliberate or accidentally, the law would still work once it has been activated. Point number three, laws have no emotional attachments, okay? Many of us try to be emotional about so many things. Laws have no emotional attachment. A law would not say, you previously obeyed me, so I will continue to work for you whether you still obey me or not. The day you break the law, it stops working for you, okay? In the same way, the converse is true. A law would not say, you ignored me all these years. Now you want to start obeying me. No, 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 I've changed my mind. No, the day you start obeying a law, you start to get the benefit of it. A law has no emotional attachment. Point number four, anyone who breaks a law will suffer the consequence of breaking the law in question. In law, the things you break, you suffer the consequence. Penalties come with breaking laws. And finally, and this is also important to know, a law would submit to another law that is higher than it. A law would submit to another law that is higher than it. That's why it's possible to fly a plane and for the plane to stay up for as long as you want. I, I learned not too long ago that there's now a direct flight to Australia, about 17 hours. So a plane can stay up for that long now. The law of gravity that says everything that goes up must come down, you know, it breaks that law. Why? Because the law of lift is higher than the law of gravity. So that law of gravity can be broken by the activation of the law of lift because the law of lift is higher than that. The law of displacement submits to the law of flotation. That's why it's possible for thousands of pounds, kilogram of sheep to float on water rather than sinking because the law of flotation is higher than the law of displacement. The natural laws submit to the supernatural laws too. The supernatural laws are higher than the natural laws. For example, the law of justice, the soul that sin it shall die. The one that commits the offense is the one that will receive the punishment. That's the law of justice. But there's a supernatural law that supersedes that. And that's the law of mercy. That I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. So the supernatural laws... So, uh, they, 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 they supersede and they override the natural laws. So there are laws that guide every aspect of life. And this is why the Apostle James urges that anyone that lacks wisdom should pray for it. Often our problems result from laws which we're either ignorant of or misunderstand or deliberately breaking. There are many issues that we suffer that are often due to our breaking laws. We suffer lack because we don't obey the laws of prosperity. You see, the laws of prosperity are not choosy. Anybody who obeys it, they can. And these principles are time-tested. They can move from penury to prosperity in a matter of time by obeying those laws. We don't grow spiritually because we don't obey the laws of spiritual growth. There are principles on how to grow. This word of the Lord shall not depart from, that, uh, from thy mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. And then you will make your way prosperous. So the laws are there. 
But we don't grow because we don't obey those spiritual laws of growth. We suffer ill health because we don't obey the laws of health. There are laws that guide health. There are laws that guide how you should treat your body. You cannot treat your body anyhow and expect not to fall ill and attract sickness. We're unhappy in our marriage because we don't allow God's law on how marriage should be run. We know these things. We learn these things, but we don't apply them and we expect to get a different result. How is it that ever possible? Find the law for the area that applies to you. Apply it and you will begin to see success happen. And this is my main message to you today. In any area, you see, thank God for the prayer that Dr. Tokwe led us on. The things that we worry about, are, they, are, they are not the things bothering God. They are not the things bothering God. You see, the mundane things about how will I pay my bills and all of that. God, God is not bothered about that. God wants us to move very quickly. Understand the laws that apply to those. Understand the law of wealth. Let your finances be settled once and for all. That you don't have to bother about it. Understand what you need to do to make yourself happy in your marriage. Let your home be settled. That you don't have to worry about it. So that you can move on to the higher agenda. The things that God wants to achieve. This is why we're getting this teaching. All those things that the pig, Jesus said it. He said these are the things that pagans worry about. It's unbelievers that worry about those things. We need to be more concerned with the higher purposes. You want to take territory for God. You know, there's homelessness in this country. God wants people that will be passionate about that. And say we want to bring a solution because we know the government cannot end it. If they could, they would have. Drug and alcohol is a big issue. Drug abuse is a big issue. God wants people that will get a kingdom agenda and say, I want to bring an end to this area and begin to work in that regard. Those are the higher purposes that God is calling us onto. So it's time for us to start finding the laws in our areas of struggle and begin to apply that and get beyond these mundane things and start to truly, truly live in the purposes that God has called us to. As I round up on this subject of faith, I now want us to consider the laws of faith. So in the same way that there are laws that govern every area of life, there are laws that also govern the subject of faith. And there are four of them, four laws of faith. The first is called the law of hearing, the law of hearing. And that is in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People of God, there's only one source of faith, and that is the word of God. That's where faith comes. There's no other way that it comes. It's by hearing. And the word hearing doesn't only mean hearing. It could mean reading. It could, but what generally exposure to the word, by exposure to the word of God. That's how faith is built in us. And that's how faith grows. The more you hear the word of God on a particular subject, the more your faith on that subject grows. You see, many wise believers, when they know that they have a need in a particular area, they just flood themselves with God's word in that area. They are in need of a healing, for example. They flood their hearts with words of healing, teachings on healing, until they contact faith. Okay? They are in penury. You know, today, Kenneth Copeland is known as the richest man of God in the world. World over is the richest man of God. But he didn't start like that. There was a time he was as poor as a church rat. But he exposed himself to the world. Took Kenneth Hagin's teachings on faith. Sucked it in until he contacted the revelation, as it were. So when you need faith in an area, flood your heart with God's word in that area. Faith comes by an encounter with the word. This is why as believers, we cannot afford to go without God's word for a while. Ideally, we need God's word each day because it's the food to our spirit man. Remember Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the, man of God, of the mouth of God. This is how we were intended to live. Our spirit man were designed to live on God's word. In any situation where a person or a group of people exercise their faith in God, 
It always started with hearing. There's one example in Exodus chapter 4, verse 31. Even in God taking the nation of Israel out of Egypt, they needed to first contact faith, to believe that God was ready to deliver them. The Bible said, so the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. How did that belief come? They heard. When they heard, then the Bible says, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. So any, the only way we contact faith is by being exposed to God's word. So if you need faith in an area, get yourself exposed to God's word in that area. Meditate on scriptures related to that subject. Read books related to that subject. Hear messages related to that subject. Flood your spirit with faith in that area. So that's the first thing. That's how we contact faith through the law of hearing. The next law is the law of imagination. The law of imagination. And the law simply says that that which you hear should draw a picture or an image in your mind. That's what imagination is. To be able to picture, to see yourself, you know, literally see myself standing in front of you here even before I do it physically. That's imagination. You've got to be able to paint a picture in your heart, okay? You want to buy a house. Do you see yourself living in that house, okay? Do you see yourself putting this decoration here and there? You've got to be able to capture that. You want to run a business. Do you see yourself running that business? That picture has got to be in your mind. The word that you hear should paint a picture in your mind. Because if you cannot see it, you cannot become it. If you cannot see it, you cannot become it. Everything that exists gets created twice. First, in the invisible realm, where you get that picture. And ultimately, it's, it's just like, can, can a house be built if an architect does not draw it first? It's impossible. You've got to get that picture in your mind. Genesis chapter 11, verse 6. God said something very strongly here about the power of imagination. The Bible says, and the Lord said, behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You see, God himself recognized that these people, if I don't throw confusion into their midst, nothing is going to stop them because they've already imagined they were going to build a city. It wasn't like there was anything wrong with their imagination, but it was contrary to God's purpose. God wanted people to spread across the earth. They wanted to build a tower to all live in one place. And God says, I have to throw confusion in their midst because anything they imagine cannot be restrained from them. That's the power of imagination. So don't let your faith end at hearing. Be very clear in your picture, in your mind. You want healing. See yourself healed of that condition. See yourself free. You want a baby. See yourself carrying a baby. Think of the name that you give that baby. Think of how you're going to go together to the park or something to play. You've got to see that image in your mind. If you don't see it, you don't become it. Look at the account of creation in Genesis chapter 1. The account of every single day ends with the statement, and God saw that it was good. It was good by what standard is the question that I ask. When it says God saw that it was good, what standard? By the standard of the image in God's mind. God himself did not just start creating things blindly and at the end of the day look at what comes out. No, he had an image in his mind. And when he finished and he looked at it, oh, this is good. Good because he came out exactly how he had seen it. So God himself had a picture and he followed what he had in mind and he created exactly that picture in mind. And that's why everything was said to be good. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 to 6, again, for you to see the power of this imagination, God took Abraham through an experience. Uh, it was Abraham at this point. The Bible says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Okay? So this is God speaking to Abraham again. 
And this is Abraham's response. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So Abraham said what was bothering him at that point. Because in Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 3, we're going to read that later. God had already told him he was going to make him a father of nations. He would make out of him the nations of the world would be blessed. And told him to leave his own country. This was years down the line. He still didn't have a child. So Abraham had concluded that as was the case in those times, when you don't have a child, your highest ranked servant will be the one that would inherit your things when you die. I said, Eliezer will be my, my heir. And God said, no. Then the Bible said, uh, then he said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Okay, let's go on. Verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this shall not be your heir. This one shall not be your heir. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Okay? But God did not end it there. The Bible says, Then God brought him outside and said, Look now towards the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Okay? And verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So even Abraham, that we call the father of faith, got to a point where his faith was shaken. And God had to help him build a picture in his mind. I said, come out, look at the stars. How many can you count? That's how. So he needed to picture. As Abraham was looking at those stars, each star, he was seeing the face of a descendant. And he thought, oh, I can't count anymore. And that was the point where his faith became solidified in his mind. And the Bible says, and he believed in the Lord. And he accounted it to him for righteousness. Amen. It's so critical to get a mental picture built based on what you have heard of God. God gives you a vision. You need to see it. You need to see yourself doing it. You know, I, I remember when, when we bought this building then, just, just 2018. Probably, <laughs> if the services were attended, maybe a third would be it. And I was thinking, God, you give us a building and we can't even feel it. But each time, when I preach, I didn't see myself preaching to the 25 or 30 people that were sitting here. I always saw this place filled. Okay? So the way I preach to one is the way I'm going to preach to a thousand. Because I saw that in, my, in the heights of my mind. I saw it. One year before we, we, the vision, even more than that, the vision of two services became realized. God showed it to me already. And I started to see it. In fact, I told my leaders, like, a little over a year before it became real because God had given me that vision. You need to be able to capture it. Capture the vision of God for your life. Kenneth Hagin, maybe I'll talk about his story in the second service because time, time would not allow me much. But now that I've said it, I know you are curious to hear it. So <laughs> I better say it then. Kenneth Hagin, he was on his sickbed. He says it as a young person. The doctors told him then that he had a weak heart a deformed heart. So he couldn't, he had no energy because his heart was weak. And he said, on the bed, on the sick bed, he caught a revelation in Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 24. We can read that quickly. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be re removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Okay? And verse 24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And he caught the revelation that God wants to heal him. That he just needed to have the faith. And there and then in the bed, he believed that God was going to heal him. He saw himself getting up. And ultimately that's what happened. One day he just stood up from the bed and he's not been sick in that manner again for the rest of his days. He caught that word. He saw the word. He saw himself walking. He did not see himself lying down. And that's exactly what happened to him at the end of the day. Law number three under the law of faith is the law of confession. You have to say what God has said in order for you to see it come to pass. It's not enough to believe it or to see it in the eyes of your mind. You need to declare or proclaim it. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So literally, the tongue has the power to speak life and it comes to pass in the same way that it has the power to speak death. Your words are powerful. So you have to be careful how you say. How much more powerful when you speak the words of God? You speak them into being. Romans chapter 10 verse 10. God was talking about the issue of salvation. You see, even when it came to the most important issue in your life, which is your salvation, your confession was needed. It was not enough that you believed in your heart. You needed to confess it. He says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if it's that important in the most important issue in your life, how much more? Everything else. The same applies. Confession unto salvation. And when it comes to confession, confession is not necessarily about speaking it to others. In fact, there are times when it may be wise to, to just incubate it and speak it to yourself. There are other times when it's important to speak it to others. For example, if God gives me a vision for the church, the vision is for the church. The people need to contact that faith. So I need to confess it. I need to say it out. But most times, on a personal level, confession is mostly about speaking it loud to yourself. Okay? Is you hearing that word again and again. You speaking it out to solidify what God has shown you. Most times, that's what confession is about. So that's the third law. That God shows us through hearing, we, we contact it, the image is built in our mind, then we speak into being that which we have heard or that which has been built into our mind. And the final one is the law of faith-based action. The law of faith-based action. The ultimate proof of your faith is that you're willing to act on what you have heard from God. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, this is another reason why Abraham was called the father of faith. The Bible says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. So God is telling him, Leave everything that you know behind. Okay? And I'm taking you to a land that I will show you. God didn't even tell him where he's taking him to. He's just saying, Follow me to a land that I will show you. It's like, you know, leave, 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 leave the United Kingdom. And just follow me to a land I'll show you. Uh, God, where am I going to? When you get to Hitra, I'll let you know. Okay? <laughs> this was what happened to Abraham. He said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham did exactly as God had told him to do. He took action on the basis of the word that God gave him. James 2, 14 to 17 that we read earlier. It says, so it is without faith, without action. The true evidence of your faith is the action that you take on the basis of what you believe. That's the true evidence of your faith, okay? It's the action that you take. And I believe this step is the rate-limiting step for many believers. Many of you have received the word of faith. Many of you have that image in your mind. You may have even confessed it, but your faith is not backed by action. You are not taking any action that shows you have faith. Okay? I told you, when God told us about a building, it wasn't about how much we had in the account. We had 9,000 plus in the account. We wanted to buy a building for the church. But even at that point, we started looking for building. We started searching for building. Because God had told us. We just knew he was going to provide when he shows us one. But if we had waited to say, ah, let's save, let's save, let's save. Even last month, the balance was 20000 I don't know how long we would have saved for before we get ready to buy a building. That's what faith-based action is. God tells you something, you start to take action. You start to work on it straight. And I know many people here are at that level. You're just held back because you're not taking action. You need to take an action proportionate to your faith. The same Kenneth Hagin that I talked about will tell you that ultimately what happened after he saw all of that image and God spoke to him on the bed. He said, do you believe that you have received your healing? He said, yes, I have received him. And God told him, he said, well, people are not usually in bed at this time of the day. And that was when he made up his mind. And he tried for the first time. To move his leg. He said it was as heavy as wood. 
But he made the effort. He saw himself standing up. And ultimately, the leg responded. That was how he got out of that sick bed for the rest of his life. In fact, only today did I got, get to hear another part of his story. So strong was his healing that when he was going to die, he told his children, uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin Jr. And, the, and, and his grandchildren, he said, you people will know when the Lord has called me to, to be and he called me to himself. And a day or two later, he went into a coma, but his heart would not stop beating. Mm. His children said, they called Kenneth Copeland, because Kenneth Copeland is like a disciple of his, and told him that his heart, that is gone. He's not responding, he's not doing anything, but his heart will not stop beating. And Kenneth Copeland had to tell them, he said, that heart, remember, was healed. That heart is maintained by the word of God. You guys have to go and pray and stop that heart, because that heart came to life by faith. It's not going to stop unless by faith. And that's how they had to let him go. When he had gone into coma, they had to pray for God to stop the heart. I only got to know that today about Kenneth Hagin. This is what happens. You need to take that action and get out and do what you need to do in line with what God has shown you. In conclusion, let us look at one of the greatest examples of faith ever recorded in the Bible and see how all these laws come together. This account is so great that it was told in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark chapter 5, verse 25 to 29. This is the account of the woman with the issue of blood. It said, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Okay? Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. You see, all four laws of faith that we talked about were at work here. The Bible said that she heard about Jesus. That's how her faith came by. She must have, and not just hearing that there's a man called Jesus, she must have heard of the great things that God was doing through Jesus. And she thought to herself, I also can get my healing from this man. Mm -hmm. And the Bible also said, for she said to herself, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. You see, this talks about two things. It talks about to herself, that confession, that internal conversation. But this lady must have also seen a picture of herself touching Jesus. That I see myself, he's walking in the crowd. I don't even need to say, hello, sir. Can you pray for me? If I just touch his garment. She saw it so clearly that it propelled her to action. And that's the action that she took. And there's no greater faith demonstrated in the Bible. You know, even the faith of the centurion that Jesus called great faith. He came to Jesus and said, you speak the word. And I believe this woman didn't even say, I don't need you to speak the word Jesus. If I don't even need you to notice me, right. I just need to touch your garment and get healed. And that's why that account is recorded in three gospels for all generations for us to know. Those four laws at work. She heard of Jesus. She had a picture in her mind. She spoke those words to herself. If I may just touch his garment, I will be healed. And she acted on it and she got healed. People of God, 2023 is fast concluding, and 2024 is fast approaching. We need to move beyond mundane things. You see, I'm so convinced of it, and maybe because I have experienced it myself. There was a time my biggest worry was financial worries, my biggest worry. It's no longer a worry for me. God has sorted me in that area. Agenda of the kingdom is what I am interested in now, okay? So I know God can move all of us to that level. Where our priorities will be about, God, what is the next thing you have for me to do? What's the next territory you have for me to take? We need faith, okay? You're going to need faith to conquer your promised land. Be willing to obey these followers of faith if you want to get the results. Let us pray. I want you to speak to the Lord today regarding what you've heard. Where are you? Where are you in that journey of the laws of faith? Where are you? 
Are you at the level of hearing? Are you at the level of imagination? Are you at the level of confession? Or are you at the level of faith-based action? Or maybe you have not even started that journey. I want you to just speak to the Lord. What are the areas where you need God to come through for you today? I want you to speak to him about it. You move mountains. You cause walls to fall with your power. Perform miracles. There is nothing that's important. That's impossible. That we're standing here. That we're standing here. Only because you move, you move mountains, you move mountains, you cause walls, you cause walls to fall with your power. You perform miracles, you perform miracles. Yeah, there is nothing, there is nothing that's impossible. That's impossible. We stand in we stand. God wants to move mountains through you. He wants to move mountains. He said, if your faith is only as small as a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain. As we round up this morning, I want you to speak to those mountains by faith. Those things that constitute mountains. Those things that constitute, is it a health issue? Is it a financial issue? Is it a marital issue? Whatever the issue may be, I want you to speak. Is it a problem at work? Just speak to that mountain by faith today. Now we're standing here only because